Hey there, everyone. This is Dave DeBow with another episode of the Property Profits Real Estate Podcast. And today, zooming in all the way from beautiful London, Ontario, we, <laughs> we have Nicole Edmonds. How are you doing today, Nicole? Very good. Thanks, Dave. How are you? I'm great. So for those of you who, are, who don't know Nicole yet, she's a very sharp, young real estate entrepreneur. I'm suspecting she's a bit of a brainiac as well because I'm reading her, her bio and she started in real estate after graduating from a degree in biology at Western Union's, uh, Western Ontario's biology program. So I think that's, that's a pretty brainiac kind of thing to be <laughs> studying. So I'm suspecting she's a smart lady. So Nicole, let's just jump right into the middle of this whole thing. So what is your main focus real estate wise these days? Yeah. So that has definitely, the answer to that question has definitely changed throughout my whole investing career. Um, but these days, uh, my portfolio is mostly multifamily rental properties um, and passive investing. So that is the property side of my portfolio. And more recently, I've moved into taking funds that I've made from those properties and lending them passively. Um, on properties, so sometimes as a money partner in JV partnering or lending, uh, and then also investing in large land development projects. So it's kind of both both sides of that. Very, very cool. So how did a kid just out of university studying biology, which has little to nothing to do with real estate investing, get inspired to get into real estate? Why'd you say, forget this biology stuff, let's focus on property stuff instead? Yeah, so it was, it was Funny, and I have to credit my mom because, um, so after I graduated from the biology program at Western, I started working uh, downtown Toronto at an advertising agency for pharmaceutical companies. Okay. And um, I came home that year uh, at Christmas and my mom had PVR'd an interview with Scott McGillivray on the Marilyn Dennis show. And on the interview, he was talking about how when he was in university, he used his OSAP payments to as down payments on rental properties, and then could essentially retire by the time he was 25 because he was making enough cash flow and income from that. And I listened to that and I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. And that, you know, that's something that he started when he was 20, like, you know, in his 20s. Um, and I was 22 or 23 at the time and would have probably otherwise never thought investing in real estate was something for someone my age, you know, not starting with a high paying job or a lot of money. Um, but because he had done it, then I, I did some research. I ended up going to a free seminar. Then I went to a three day workshop and was sold on the, this concept that you can buy rental properties, have them positively cash flow, supplement your income, and not have to work. That sounded pretty good. So, um, so that's kind of what what got me started. Very cool. So, what did you start off with? And 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 you've had a very interesting progression in your real estate investing career. You're just telling us about what you're focusing on these days. How did that all get going? Yeah. So, I, so after that um, that training, I was eager to buy a cash flowing property, start supplementing my income, but I was definitely nervous. You know, is this too good to be true is what I was thinking. And I didn't know anything about renovation. So the thing that I started with was student rentals. Um, I purchased one student rental, it was turnkey. I think I probably picked student rental because being in my early twenties, the idea of having tenants and being the landlord to tenants that were uh, my parents' age was very intimidating. But the idea of managing tenants who were students, I could handle. So I bought a turnkey student rental, uh, and I just wanted to you see. By turnkey, you meant you you bought one that was already up and running as a student rental. You didn't have to do anything special with it. It came with tenants included. Exactly. I think I actually closed in like the spring, so we needed to get new tenants. But that was really the only work yeah. um, for it to start cash flowing. But yeah, no renovation. It was already there. It was a five bedroom student rental. Um, so yeah, I started with that and I just wanted to see if this works and I bought it. The rent checks came in, the expenses went out, there was positive cash flow in between. And I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. I, so I needed was, So was that, was it significant positive cash flow? Cause we, we hear that student rentals can be great for, for, for cash flow, especially eight years ago when the property prices were a lot less than they are now. How was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the cash flow is right around $500 per month. 
That was the positive cash flow after all expenses. Um, and you're right, like this was, this would have been six, seven years ago. Um, and the purchase price was close to $200,000 for a five bedroom student rental. You rent each bedroom out for 450. They're definitely, it's definitely a cash flow strategy is to go, to go that route. Very good. So, yeah, so, All right. So you start with student rentals and then where yeah. did you go? Yeah. So I did a couple student rentals. It was working. And then I got some confidence and, uh, and I moved into, I purchased a triplex, um, mm -hmm. that required a renovation. So now it was multifamily. It wasn't students anymore and it required a renovation and a refinance and then to rent out and hold. Um, and once I, once I did that, then I, I saw that, okay, this is where I want to be there. For me, there was less headache than student rentals and student rental, a student rental portfolio is a great strategy, but it wasn't a strategy that I wanted to go with. Uh, so I started focusing on these smaller multifamily properties, um, and, and renovating them. So the Burr strategy with multifamily and did a triplex, did a fourplex, I think did a two-plex, a uh, duplex, and kind of stayed there, went up to a five-plex, and then up to an eight-plex. And so um, I've since sold the two student rentals, but maintain those multifamily properties in my portfolio now. All right, so that's interesting. So why did you decide to switch from the student rentals, get rid of that, and, and focus on, you know, those tenants that initially intimidated, intimidated you in the first place? Yeah. Um, so the intimidation part, I think, was gone now because I had some experience, right? I, I understood a little bit more how the landlord tenant board worked, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I think I didn't like student rentals because, first of all, there's, there's tenant turnover every year and you're competing with a lot of other houses that are turning over at the same time every year. There's that. And then if you do have a vacancy or Say you need you wanted to rent uh, the house out in May, but you didn't get anybody. Now you've got September and you have four months of vacancy in between. Hmm. Um, with multifamily properties, I, I started to see and I was learning and understanding that with multifamily properties, if you have a vacancy, say in your triplex, you probably only have one unit that's gone vacant and you're still collecting income from two other units. So the risk is different. It's, it's better when it comes to multifamily. Um, and then also the expenses, you know, with a, with a triplex, you're collecting three rents and you're looking after one lawn and snow removal for one driveway. Um, there's one roof to repair. So even the cash flow uh, formulas just kind of, they work out better when you move toward multifamily properties. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to understand the, the big benefit of a triplex versus a student rental. So again, what, what I'm hearing is it's the consistency of cash flow more more than anything because with the student rental if i understood you correctly the challenge is there's the summertime months where you might be vacant or have a bunch of vacancies september hits now you're competing with all of the other student rentals to get as many students as humanly possible at this exact same time so there's a lot more competition versus a triplex if somebody vacates one of the units the other two are still going and they're probably only vacant for max one month while you get a new tenant into that unit. Would, would that be? Am I yeah, correctly? yeah, exactly. And uh, when I was starting, I was very, I, I would, I would describe myself as a very conservative investor because I needed to make sure that these properties were paying for themselves. Mm -hmm. The income I was making from my job and like the cash I had on hand was not enough to sustain these properties. If I had a prolonged vacancy or if I ran my numbers wrong, or if the repairs and maintenance were higher than I had anticipated, I needed to focus on high cash flow so that these properties could completely sustain themselves without me having to put money into it. Smart. Smart. All right. So student rentals, small multis, starting again in multifamilies, then where did things go? Uh, so then because I started early 20s and now I'm 30 now, um, my lifestyle and my my where I'm allotting my time has changed. So while at the beginning I was like totally focused on cash flow, multifamily, all over Ontario, just wherever the numbers worked regardless of how much time or if I had to, you know, find a new handyman in that area, it was okay because for me, I was valuing my time much less than uh, I, I wanted that cash flow. Um, 
So then, and also I wasn't starting with a lot of capital. So I had to join a venture partner at the beginning and use a lot of creative financing strategies, borrow down payments to buy properties or buy, renovate, pull equity out to do the next one. So a lot more, um, yeah, creative financing stuff. So as the portfolio started to grow with multifamily properties and some money was coming back out of it, and I wanted to focus some more on other, other things outside of real estate in my life, um, I started to take those funds and lend them passively uh, to other investors who were in a more active stage of their investing careers. So just kind of being on the other side of it um, and doing the land development projects, which is where I'm just taking money, putting it out there, being completely passive and silent, and then collecting a return. Very cool. So at what point were you able to quit the job and focus 100% on real estate investing? So after about two years of investing in real estate, I stopped working full time and went to part time. Mm -hmm. And then after about another two years, I stopped working part time, which would have then been would have been two years ago. So about two years ago, um, I stopped I stopped working as, at a job. Very cool. Very cool. So I saw in your bio that one of the things you you work with are syndicated mortgages. Can you mm -hmm. tell us what is a syndicated mortgage? <clears throat> yeah, so um, it's where there's multiple people putting money in uh, and lending it as a mortgage to an investor. So I've done it um, where I've, I've lent to, say, an investor who's buying an apartment building. They're going to renovate it. They need financing for that time. Myself and some other investors pool our funds. That's the syndicated part. We put a mortgage on that property. They do their renovations. They then get it appraised and financed with a bank and then pay us back our money. So they're usually short term uh, lending opportunities, like one to two years. And the ones that I've done have paid um, between 14 and 19 percent per year. Wow, that's great. And they, so it's, so it's kind of like bridge financing, basically. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And I mean, there's other opportunities that I see that are longer or shorter. But um, yeah, they're, and that's why the investor is paying such a high rate they're paying you know double digit rate because they're doing it for the short term it makes sense for them because obviously what they're making off the deal is way more than what they're paying in interest mm -hmm. and then they're going to get it appraised with a or financed with the bank and and pay a lower interest rate at that point but um that's something that i, I mean it's a great tool for you know if you've got some funds sitting there and you want to have your money working all the time you don't want it sitting in your bank account so you invest it out, you make 15%, maybe while you were working on another invest, uh, renovation project or something, mm -hmm. and then, you know, keep your money working for you. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. So is that usually done through a mortgage broker or do you set these things up yourself or how, how does the structure of that typically work? The syndicated ones I've done through a mortgage broker. Mm -hmm. Um, and those have been for bigger projects. And then I've also done, cause now I've focused more on, um, some of the passive stuff. Uh, I've lent money, not syndicated mortgage, but a private mortgage to other investors who are doing the same kind of thing. Um, and, and very similar to what I started doing, buying, renovating, refinancing, renting it out. And, uh, and, but that's where I've lent individual mortgages to those people. But so if, I, if I understand correctly, Nicole, so you built up your portfolio initially, uh, multifamily properties, they've gone up in value. Now you're taking some of the equity out of those properties and investing passively in other people in their deals and, and making a nice spread on the difference between what you have to pay and, and what you're getting in. Would that be a fair assumption? Exactly. Yeah, smart, very, very smart. So I know uh, also looking at your bio a little bit, you've got experience not only investing in, in Canadian properties, but you've also gone south of the border. Is that correct? You've done some deals yeah. in the States. Tell us a little bit about that. So I, some of the land development deals that I've passively invested in have been uh, have been in the states, um, but in the yeah in my bio there I, I mentioned the plots of land that I purchased in the U.S. So those were vacant plots of land, plots of land uh, in Florida, not swamp land, but <laughs> vacant plots of land, um, serviced plots of land in neighborhoods, and so that strategy is because I want this to be clear, it is completely different from the cash flow multifamily conservative strategy. That is a speculative, stra speculative strategy. You're investing in it 
hoping the, the um, value of that property is going to go up and you're going to cash out. So mind you, they were cheap. They were um, there a few years ago. Were you, and, were, you get, were you getting them through tax tax deeds or tax liens or something interesting like that? Or just uh, they, they weren't. They were actually like a large portfolio that somebody had sold and then it was split up and I oh. had purchased a couple from that portfolio. Um, so it was discounted at, at, at that point. But yeah, I do want it to be clear that that is not, you know, because sometimes people will reach out to me and say, oh, I heard, you know, I'm interested in doing this land development thing and I want, uh, or land uh, banking thing and I want cash flow. Those are not the same strategy. You're making no cash flow. You're not renting it out. So in fact, I, in fact you're paying out because you guys still got to cover the taxes and utilities. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's a small portion of my portfolio. And I mean, I think that's still, it's still important to diversify, but that's not my meat and potatoes. Yeah. So Nicole, it hasn't been that long, although you've done a whole bunch of stuff in a relatively short period of time. So if you were starting all over again from scratch, is there anything that you would do, you know, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently if you started all over again from scratch today? Mm -hmm. That is, and that's such a, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer because yeah, if I was starting today with all of the knowledge and experience. Yeah, with, with all the knowledge you have, yes. And experience and everything, okay. I probably would have skipped student rentals um, and moved right into multifamily, larger multifamily. I would have skipped turnkey. I would have gone right into buy, renovate, refinance, um, and holding properties. Uh, and I And I think one of the this is probably something that slows people down is there's a lot of um, stress and anxiety before purchasing a rental property. And when you're getting started and my tenants rate late on rent, that's the first, you know, and then the tenant pays five days later and you, I, why did I lose sleep over that? And, you know, as you go longer, Oh, now I have a tenant who has caused all this damage and that stresses you out. Or now I have a tenant who says they're going to whatever. So you have all these different stresses and, and the bar is raised all along the way. If I could go back, I would not stress all over all of those things because <laughs> there's solutions to all of them, right? You yeah. serve the right form, you follow the process. There, you know, don't let it don't let it weigh on you. So that's something that if I could go back, but I, all those things are part of growing. You know what I mean? So it's hard to. It, it's, it's, hard. it's just always it's always interesting to know because it's just a theoretical thing, right? Because all of that got you to where you are now. So you wouldn't trade any of that for anything, right? Because that's exactly. part of the process, right? But it's always interesting. Yeah. Okay, hindsight, knowing what I know now, this is what I might do differently. Very, very cool. Nicole, time flies when we're having fun. So if people want to find out more about Nicole Edmonds or perhaps connect with you, what should they do? Yeah, they can go to my website, investwithnicole.com. Um, there's a contact page there. I'm always happy to share um, you know, my experience and the knowledge that I've gathered. So there's, yeah, they're welcome to contact me there. Perfect. Now, one last question, because you, you piqued my curiosity here. It says, one of the things you're enjoying doing with all of this free time that you have now, thanks to real estate investing, is working on your bus conversion. Tell yeah. me, what is a <laughs> bus conversion? What are you converting a bus into? Or what are you converting into a bus? Okay, I bought a shuttle bus. And I... It, with some help with some uh, from some friends and family, we've taken it apart, taken out the insides and we're converting it into a camper. And uh, my, I went into this with very little renovation or building experience, despite my real estate experience, because I was not doing those renovations. Yeah. Um, but this I'm, I'm trying to do, uh, be a part of all of it, like the build of all of it. And oh. I am having so much fun learning and it's really fun. Excellent, excellent. All right. Keep up the good work, Nicole. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks so much, Dave. All right, everybody. Take care and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Well, hey there. Thanks for tuning into the Property Profits Podcast. If you like this episode, that's great. Please go ahead and subscribe on iTunes. Give us a good review. That'd be awesome. I appreciate that. And if you're looking to attract investors and raise capital for your deals, then I'm going to invite you to get a complimentary copy of my newest book, Right back there. There it is. The Money Partner Formula. You can get a PDF version at InvestorAttractionBook.com. Again, InvestorAttractionBook.com. Take care.